There are a lot of people in this country who think government is corrupt, who think government is rigged against them. They think that people above them get bailouts, people below them get handouts, and they're left to struggle for themselves. We can argue on the substance of some of this, but I think that the fate of democracy and the fate of capitalism are linked. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with David Axelrod. David is a veteran of politics and journalism and the former chief strategist and senior advisor to President Barack Obama. He currently serves as director of the University of Chicago's nonpartisan Institute of Politics and is host of the Axe Files, a podcast jointly produced by CNN and his institute. David is a former political writer for the Chicago Tribune and media strategist behind 150 state, local, and national campaigns. He is author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, Believer, My 40 Years in Politics. David, welcome to the podcast. I've watched and admired on a firsthand basis your Institute of Politics engage University of Chicago students on a nonpartisan way on political and public policy issues. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks, Hank. So let's start with a young David Axelrod. Tell us about your upbringing in New York City. What were some of your early interests and how did they get shaped by your time in New York? I grew up in Stuyvesant Town, uh, which years later would become the site of one of the worst real estate deals in history. But it was uh, built for returning war veterans in the 1940s. My parents moved there in 1948. I was born in 1955. And it was a very kind of austere but pleasant uh, housing development. I still have friends uh, who I grew up with there. I just saw a bunch of them in New York just recently. And it, it affected my development in, in profound ways, um, not the least of which was when I was five years old, uh, John F. Kennedy came campaigning in New York City. This was 12 days, Hank, before the 1960 election, which tells you how long ago it was that a Democrat was actually campaigning in New York uh, 12 days before the election, but he was making 10 stops in the city that day, and he stopped off in Stuyvesant Town, middle of the day. And this woman um, who took care of me when uh, my mom was at work, this wonderful woman named Jessie Berry, took me uh, out to 20th Street, which, you know, you probably know is a large boulevard down there by Stuyvesant Town. But instead of cars, it was filled with people. She put me up on a mailbox. The mailbox is still there. I went back and saw it a few years ago. And I watched this incredible spectacle of this very inspiring young man climbing up onto this uh, makeshift platform and talking about the future of the country. And uh, I will tell you this, but you'll immediately suspect that I'm making it up. He said uh, that day, uh, I'm not running on the platform that says, if you elect me, everything will be easy. So being an American citizen in the 1960s is a hazardous occupation filled with peril and hope. And we'll decide in this election which path we take. I know that now, not because I remember it from when I was five years old, but you can look it up on Google, the speech that he made in Stuyvesant Town that day. But I remember it because, or I've in, embedded it in my consciousness, because it sort of sums up my view of politics, that politics in a democracy is the way we grab the wheel of history and turn it in the direction that we think is best for the future. And I just got hooked right at that, you know, that day. And I started following him and the news and campaigned for his brother. When I was nine, he was running for the Senate in New York. And, you know, that really got me started, uh, my, my sort of passion for politics and news. It's fascinating because when he was running for election, I was at Barrington High School in Barrington, Illinois, in Cook County, a suburb of Chicago. I didn't know many Democrats. They're all, yeah. all Republicans. Yes. And so he came to our high school and, uh, you know, made a speech. I don't remember what he said, but remember being quite impressed with the individual. But again, you know, I thought it was going to be a, a bad thing if he won the election. And I remember after the election, I sort of thought the world had ended. And my mother took me aside 
And uh, she became a Democrat after my father <laughs> passed on, right? But <laughs> she took me aside and she told me, she said, let me tell you, the world hasn't ended. That's what people said when Harry Truman was elected. And he's one of the best presidents we ever had. And so don't be upset about it. Yeah, well, I listen, I, you know, I moved to Illinois when I was 17. And uh, so when I, you know, with that interest of politics, I, I started studying politics closely. Uh, even as I was a student at the University of Chicago, I became a student journalist. But Barrington was, you know, what the old uh, Mayor Daly used to call the country towns. They, you know, they were way out there somewhere. So uh, I, I know, I know of Barrington, uh, exotic as it as it seemed to me then. And, and I grew and I grew up on a farm, so it really was a country town. So how was it you ended up going from New York, from Stuyvesant Village, to the University of Chicago? You know, uh, actually, my interest in politics had something to do with it. There, there were really three factors. One is obviously I knew that it was a it was a fine university, and um, I actually went and visited there. And, you know, it's funny the way young people think. I mean, I took a stroll through the campus, and I thought, this is what a university should look like. This is my vision of what a university should look like. So all of that was part of it. Part of it was a more mundane thing, which was my homeroom teacher at Stuyvesant High School in New York. His guy named Jerry Liebner told me, you know, if you choose a school that's more than 600 miles from New York, your parents will never surprise you with a visit because they'll have to buy a plane ticket. So mm -hmm. I thought that was good common wisdom. And then the third reason was being as passionate about politics as I was, I knew that Chicago was the home of the last of the big city machines, Mayor Daley. I knew that it had been uh, the scene of one of the most uh, uh, significant uh, events of the 1960s, the 68 convention, and, and Hyde Park, where the university was home to uh, a budding Black political independent movement. And I thought all those things were fascinating. I thought this would be a really interesting place to be. You know, my problem, Hank, was the University of Chicago at that time was a great university as it is today, but a lot more inward looking. And, um, you know, I came there then it was hard to engage people on things that happened after the year 1800. So that's why I became a journalist, because I wanted to write about Chicago politics and have discussions about Chicago politics. And so I went to work for a little newspaper called the Hyde Park Herald, which encompasses the area where the university is. And uh, uh, and that's really how my career began. I, I was much more attentive frankly, to my journalism than I was to my studies, much to my detriment, but it all worked out. Well, that was really going to bring me to my next question is why journalism? But thinking back on your comment about the University of Chicago, remember that's where the t-shirt used to say, it works in practice, but does it work in theory, right? Yes. <laughs> and so it's become much more outward looking today. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I give, uh, I give our former president, now chancellor, Bob Zimmer, a great deal of credit for that. I mean, when I started, and I, I don't want to jump ahead in the discussion, but when I, when I wanted to start a, uh, an institute of politics at the end of my political career, I sat down with Bob Zimmer, the president of the University of Chicago, and I was very candid with him. The first thing I said to him when we sat down at lunch was, Bob, I went to the university, I went to the college at the university, and I hated my experience, and I want to tell you why. And I said, all I heard about was the life of the mind, and I was interested in the life of the world, and there was nowhere for me to go to explore those issues in a very pragmatic way. And he listened very patiently, and at the end of this, I figured he'd either throw me out or we would have something to talk about. And all he said was, that's why we need your institute. And that's the way he approached the whole university. And Hank, your presence on yeah. that campus was a part of that. Yep, that's exactly what he told me. And then he could get it done. He could get things done very quickly, which is very unusual in academia. Yeah. Rather, rather than there being a long negotiation and as to how to set it up, boy, let's do it and let's get yeah. it done. Yeah, no, it was great. So you went to the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. Got an internship. Yes. You told me what drew you to, to journalism, but what were those early years like as a young reporter? My mother had been a journalist and was uh, she worked at a newspaper called PM in New York in the 1940s, became a freelance journalist. So, you know, there was this sort of tradition of news. My family, my mother uh, told me that she named my sister and I with a mind toward how our names would look in bylines. So if you think you have, you know, <laughs> sort of free will, forget about it. Uh, you know, when I went to the Hyde Park Carroll, I walked in there when I was 18 years old. 
I had had one brief internship in New York, uh, journalism inter internship, and there was a the general manager of the newspaper, a guy named Mervyn Bohannon, said to me, we just lost our political columnist who graduated from law school and he's going to become an assistant uh, state attorney general. He's going to be a prosecutor in the t attorney general's office. Uh, do you, you know, you think you could do that, write a political column? And I said, absolutely. I have no doubt, which was insane when you think about it. Although I will tell you, I look back at my first column in 1973, December of 1973. And you know what the topic was? It was about Mayor Daley, the congressman from the, the area whose name was Ralph Metcalf, who was a, a pillar of the Democratic machine. And he broke with Daley over the issue of police uh, excessive force by police, police brutality. And that's what the first column was about, about the standoff on. So we're 50 years later, we're still having the same discussions. But I, when I got to the Tribune, by the time I got to the Tribune, they hired me on the strength of the work I had done at the Hyde Park Herald. But uh, they said to me, the city editor, a guy who became a great mentor of mine, Bernie Judge, said to me, you know, you know more about Chicago politics than anybody here, but you don't really know yet how to be a reporter. So uh, you're going on nights. And I spent two and a half years on covering the night side. I, I came in at two, uh, six at night and I worked until two in the morning. And I covered a side of life that I just never been exposed to before. A lot of crime and fires and the L falling off the tracks in a catastrophic way and all kinds of stuff. But in, in the course of that, I learned so much about the city. And I really fell in love with the city, also with a woman from the city, which kept me here as well. I consider those years, the, my eight years at the Chicago Tribune, which was the predicate to my political career, my career in politics, I consider them the, the formative years of my life. I learned, more, I, and I say this with apologies to my peers and colleagues at the University of Chicago, but this is more a function of me than them. I learned more at the, in the newsroom of the Chicago Tribune than I did in any school or university I ever attended. So it was a great, it was really a great experience. And it was the end, Hank, of the front page era of Chicago journalism. So there was still this incredible enthusiasm about the story. And, you know, I, I covered City Hall for a while in Chicago and Jane Byrne was the mayor of Chicago and colorful character. But I would clash with her a lot, not not for any purpose of mine, but, you know, I, I was exposing a lot of corruption in the city and she was very unhappy about that. But I just learned so much in that job. And the other thing, heck, I'd say about it is what I realized that when I wrote a memoir years and years later was I also learned how to tell a story. And I realized in retrospect, that's really what I've done in politics as well the ability to sort of tell a story about who people are, where they want to lead, it was it became central to my work in uh, as a political consultant. Amen. You know, I was a English literature major in college. I thought I was going to go on and have a career, maybe teaching, writing, writing fiction. And boy, uh, later in life, when I started working to write books, and I realized I needed a big team to help me because it, and I used to be critical of journalists because I thought they oversimplified. And I realized I knew how to make simple things complex, <laughs> make <laughs> complex things simple. You, um, you know, I, I've been getting a lot of questions uh, today as we record this conversation because President Obama is going out on the campaign trail and, you know, people ask me, you know, why, and there are strategic reasons why he's very valuable right now to Democrats. But the other element, and Bill Clinton had this as well, he has the ability to tell a story about where the country is and where the country is going. And he has the ability to do it in terms that people understand. He evokes stories and he speaks in common sense phrases. And, and that's a great gift. Storytelling is a real, real important element of leadership. And, uh, you know, you think back to the great presidents of our time, you know, Lincoln and Roosevelt, who governed through crises, their ability to tell a story and engage the country in that story was central to their, to their uh, leadership. 
Absolutely. And so you've already gotten into this, you know, the shift from journalism to politics. You know, you might talk a little bit about that. I mean, you mm -hmm. made a pivotal decision back in 2003 when you decided to run the Senate campaign of a political neophyte with no name recognition, then state Senator Barack Obama. And you know, I, I remember I lived in the Chicago area. I was run, running a, a Chicago office of Goldman Sachs. I thought I was plugged in. I'd never heard of him before. My, my friend John Bryan, who who was the CEO of uh, Sarah, Lee, Sarah yeah. Lee at the time, mm -hmm. had told me, he said, let me tell you this. I really believe in this man. He, he, he's got a great future. But I, I'd never heard of him. So what what led you to make that decision? And yeah. Uh, you take that on. I owe it all to a uh, a friend of mine, named Betty Lou Saltzman. Uh, you may remember her father, Phil Klutznik, who became yeah. Secretary of Commerce, but a, a major real estate developer here in the Chicago area, leader in the world Jewish community. Betty Lou is sort of a doyenne of liberal politics here. And she called me in 1992 and she said, I just met the most extraordinary young man and I think you ought to meet him too. And I said, I'm happy to meet anybody you want to meet, Betty Lou, but why? Uh, she said, because I think he might be the first black president of the United States. And I was like, well, that's pretty grandiose, you know, but I said, I'm happy to meet. And Barack and I went out to lunch and he had just gotten back from Harvard Law School and he was running a voter registration drive in Chicago and he had joined a small civil rights law firm and he was teaching at the university of chicago and he said to me you know i, I want to be about something larger than myself and i think i may want to be in public service and i just wanted to talk to you about that and we had a good conversation but the thing hank that struck me and you've been around political people for a very long time too uh you know the thing that struck me was here was a guy who was the first African-American president of the Harvard Law Review. It was national news at that time. It was the New York Times wrote a piece about it because it was, you know, so historic. And it was very clear to me that he could have written his ticket at any corporation, any financial firm, any law firm in America. And instead, he came back to run a voter registration drive and practice law at a small civil rights firm and teach. And I thought, you know, my experience has been that the world of politics divides into two cohorts, the people who run for office because they want to be something and the people who run for office because they want to do something. And he very clearly was in that second group. And to me, that's the more admirable group. And we became friends, you know, at that moment. It, but I didn't really work for him until a decade later. He had lost a race for Congress. He had become a state senator. He had lost a race for Congress by not a little. He lost by like 30 points. And a lot of people kind of had written him off politically. He was in debt. And he called me in the summer of 2002. He said, I've got one race left. He said, I've spoken with Michelle. And I told her, I want to make this race. And if I lose, I will go out and make a living, you know, and I will forget this political thing, but I want to run for the United States Senate. We had a Republican senator at that time named Peter Fitzgerald. He turned out to be a one-term senator because he he quit. But at that time, Obama thought he would be running against Fitzgerald, but he had to get through a primary. And here he had lost this race by 30 points, which isn't exactly a springboard to uh, running for the United States Senate. But I had such a high regard for him. And I was at a sort of crossroads in my life as well, because an old client of mine, had approached me and said he wanted to run for governor. And you'll recognize this name right away, too. His name was Rod Blagojevich. Oh, boy. And Rod Blagojevich, you know, and, and Rod, who I, you know, who to this day, you know, I have I have warm feelings about him, despite everything. Uh, but he said to me, I want to run for governor. And I said, why? And he said, well, you can help me figure that out. And I said, Rod, if I have to help you figure it out, you shouldn't run. You tell me why you want to run, and we can talk about how to best communicate that. But I'm not in the business of telling you why why you want to run for governor. And he said, well, you know, come on, we're going to raise more money that's ever been raised. And, this, and, that. and I, I immediately like said, you know what, uh, this I'm 
getting off the train now. Good luck to you. And by the summer of 2020, uh, uh, 2002, it was very clear to me he had won the primary. He was going to win. They were running a you know textbook campaign, state-of-the-art campaign. He got a very smart firm working for him. He was running as a reformer because his predecessor, George Ryan, was also headed to the penitentiary as Blagojevich would be later. I, I really was feeling like maybe I need to get out of politics because if you have to be so cynical to succeed, maybe this isn't the thing for an idealist, you know. And um, and then Obama called me and said he wanted to run for the Senate. And I thought, I, I talked to my wife, Susan, and I said, you know what, if I could help Barack get elected to the United States Senate, that would be something I'd really be proud of. That would be something that would recharge my batteries. So, you know, there are other candidates who approached me. Some had more money, some had more political uh, cachet. But uh, I really was inspired by Barack. And I um, and I took that on and we started off as a third tier campaign. And um, he ended up winning the primary by a landslide. Yep. And he won the general election. And then let's skip ahead. You played a pivotal role in Obama's historic 2008 victory. What was it like working with presidential candidate Obama? Well, first of all, let me just say that Senate race was kind of a template uh, for the presidential race. We didn't think of it that way at that time, but it turned out that was the case. We ran against conventional politics. We ran against the politics of cynicism. We ran against the politics of division. We ran against the politics that sort of valued power over uh, over principle and progress. And there was a real market for that. So it wasn't his intention. In fact, he, he you know, one of our early priorities was to signify that he wasn't going to run for anything in, in 2008 because we didn't want people of Illinois to think he was just using the Senate seat as a way station. And then as time went on, it became very clear that Obama's candidacy in 2008 was as close to a draft as you can have in politics. Not that we didn't put logs on the fire here and there, but you know, there was a real hue and cry for him, including Harry Reid, the majority leader, calling him in and asking him to run because Harry felt that Obama was anti-war. He had been against the war in Iraq. All the other candidates, major candidates, including Hillary Clinton, had been for the war in Iraq. And he felt that being against the war was a, a real asset, would be in 2008. And he, I think they appreciated Obama's talents. I honestly didn't know at the beginning of 2007. I mean, I was all in and excited, but um, I've been around presidential politics long enough. I did my first presidential race in, two, in 1988, and I knew the process very well, and I knew how unforgiving the process was. And, you know, my question for him, and I wrote a memo, a strategic memo to him about, you know, the path forward and how I thought he could win. But I also raised questions, which is, I don't know if you're Muhammad Ali or Floyd Patterson. Now, these, you know, two great heavyweight champions, but Floyd Patterson had one unfortunate liability, which is he had kind of a glass jaw. Glass so if jaw, you yeah. hit, him, hit him in the jaw, he would be knocked out. And Obama did not like being criticized because he had never really been in a competitive race. The Senate race turned out to be non-competitive. But even so, he was running in the general election against a guy named Alan Keyes, who was, you know, kind of a like right wing gadfly and but very kind of irritating. And in I would say that Keyes got the better of Obama in a series of debates because he just got under his skin. And so one of my questions was, how would he take the relentless pounding that comes with running? And the second thing is just, it's kind of a ridiculous process in some ways. I mean, the things that you have to do, the sort of relentlessness of it. Um, I mean, I believe in the process because I think being president of the United States, as you uniquely appreciate, is such a difficult job that, you know, I think it's people want to see you under these kind of pressures to see how you react to different kinds of challenges during a campaign. But it's hard. It's really, really hard. And for the first six months, he was not a very good candidate. And he would tell you that. He went to, uh, I think it was in Las Vegas, there was an early forum on healthcare. He was there with John Edwards and Hillary Clinton. 
Edwards had made himself passively fluent in this. Hillary obviously knew a lot about health care. And Obama didn't look good. I mean, he just didn't he didn't know as much. And he came back and he said, she looked like a president up there and I didn't. And he said, I'm not a very good candidate right now, but give me time and I'm going to figure this thing out. By the summer of 2007, he really did figure it out. And he, you know, we had a great final six months of 2007 as he kind of his trajectory grew. But, you know, that's an extremely long answer to your question. But the bottom line on it is what I learned about him was just how steep his learning curve was and how good he was at sort of learning from every experience and improving his himself, which is not always the case with politicians. Yeah, I, I saw it on a firsthand basis during the financial crisis. Yes. Because when he would call me, it wouldn't just be to sort of touch base so he could say he would do it. There'd be long, detailed calls where he asked a lot of questions, and uh, it was really quite remarkable. Well, Hank, let me just say, you you may not know this, but you were a figure in all of this of this election drama on September fourteenth uh, of two thousand and eight, uh, when we were in the final sprint to the election with John McCain. He had picked. Sarah Palin as his running mate McCain. And the race actually had narrowed. And I called strategy meeting at my office on a Sunday and uh, Senator Obama asked to attend. And um, we went through all, all of the strategic things we needed to do. And at the end of it, he said, I got a call from Hank Paulson last night. He said, I can't tell you the details of, of that discussion. But I could just tell you something's going to happen overnight that's going to be significant. And I'm just telling all of you that this is one of those times when good government really is good politics. And I don't want anybody playing any games on this. I told Hank I'd be as helpful as I could be. And I intend to be. And that's the way we're going to roll from here. And then, of course, we all woke up to the Lehman Brothers collapse, and we knew exactly what he meant. Uh, And that really shaped the rest of that campaign. And the, and and the future of his presidency. And also the first really long conversation I had with him was earlier, which was before we moved on Fannie and Freddie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and before we, you know, essentially nationalized them. And boy, he spent a long time on the phone then. And that's what he said to me. He said to me, look, I think I'm going to be president. I don't want to inherit an economic wasteland. So if, if, it, you ever get into a situation where it looks like really on the brink, please get to me. David, I want to move now to you go to the White House a, as the advisor to President Obama. Mm-hmm. So now you're you're governing. So talk a little bit about the mind shift, what it was like, what your job entailed, and uh, how it was different uh, working for the now President Obama rather than the candidate Obama. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, let me say I, I was nervous about going. I uh, It may seem like an obvious uh, decision to go. For someone who as a young man dreamt of such things, I mean, I, Ted Sorensen and all those guys in the White House under the Kennedy administration and its succeeding administrations, you know, I, I thought of them as uh, I did about you know, all-star players on baseball cards. They were people I revered. As I told President-elect Obama, uh, I had crafted my whole life. The thing that makes you a great reporter is your sort of suspicion of authority, the, the ability to challenge authority. And I said to him, I've structured my whole life so that I could tell anybody to go F themselves. And you can't really do that to the president of the United States. And he's and he kind of smiled. He said, no, I guess you really can't. And he said, but here are all the reasons why I want you to come and why I need you and why you should come. And uh, at the end of the conversation, he said, and one other thing, and I always say, you can tell me to go F myself. Just don't do it in front of anybody else. Now, it never came to that. I never had to. And one of the reasons I never had to was because he behaved in an exemplary way and he you know he made smart decisions and even if i disagreed with the decisions he made he always made a reasoned argument for why he had to make the decision uh, that he made but he was always a good listener and i was there in particularly difficult years 2009 2010 the thing the transition was startling because no matter how serious and how 
significant campaigns are, you know, it's nothing like a single day in the White House when every decision you make there, because only the like really significant ones come there. I, I always say like a president's words can send markets, uh, you know, tumbling and armies marching. And there's so many significant things that you have to be aware of. And, you know, we were there, we had two wars raging in Afghanistan and Iraq. The financial crisis was reaching its peak or would reach its peak. And it was a very vital an important time to be there and a scary time for the first few months, Hank, and I'm sure you were in touch with some of these people, but, you know, our, our economic advisor said, look, the financial system could collapse and we could be headed for a second great depression. I mean, that's a hell of a way to start your day, you know, to hear that. And so that's a lot different than the things that I had done in the past. It was an experience that I would never trade. It was the greatest professional experience of my life, the epitome of service. And I, I would never do it again, you know, because it, it was just so, so incredibly draining. It's an interesting thing because George Bush as president was similar in one respect that he wanted candid advice from me and I'm very direct. And so I would meet with him one-on-one. -on -one. He clearly you, you couldn't be really candid if there are a lot of people around. Right. right. But he wanted that. And the other thing I really respect uh, President Obama for, I believe that we had had a set of policies that uh, Tim Geithner and Bernanke and I had worked on together, where we had recapitalized a couple hundred banks before we left. We'd nationalized Fannie and Freddie. Uh, we'd done a lot of things. We'd given you the emergency authorities to deal with, with the autos. And, and so I was concerned that um, that President Obama, you know, under political pressure from others and and and, uh, and from a party that didn't want to do any favor from the banks, would would go in a different direction. And there are those debates and discussions, but ultimately Tim Geithner prevailed, right, his advisor with the president, and and the president took the heat to do some things that were very unpopular and made a big difference. And so, yeah. I never, ever heard him say, yeah, that would be the right thing to do, but uh, I just can't do it because it's too politically fraught that he would, he, he never thought that way. It is true that I think he and the Democratic Party, you know, you will never know what the price would be, would have been politically for not doing what he did uh, and having the whole economy collapse. Right. That, But there was a political price for doing what he did. And I, it still reverberates today. There, there was this sense that the people who propagated the uh, sure. financial crisis uh, got bailed out and millions and millions of Americans were left to struggle and lo lose their homes and so on. And uh, it was painful and it was hard, you know, and he felt it. And, you know, he used to get letters from people across the country about their personal struggles. It, you know, it was very, very hard, but he did what he thought his uh, his duty required. Yeah, you have to make tough decisions. And sometimes you, you do something that's that's ugly and not popular and not perfect, but it's better than the alternative. The political problem with that is you don't experience the alternative. That's right. right. I remember with, with Barney Frank explaining to me when I when I went in and, and, and Barney Frank, who ran the House yeah. Financial Services yeah. Committee. Banking Committee. When I went in and and, uh, and explained to him that uh, that we needed to do some very very unpopular things, and if we didn't, we we could maybe have another Great Depression. And he said, "Well, this is very very difficult because you never get credit for it. it can prove a counterfactual, right?" <laughs> and, yeah, right. It's like, well, it's like Walter Cronkite once said, we don't report the cats that didn't run away that day. Let's just say before you move on, two people who don't get enough credit, I think, were Nancy Pelosi and Barney Frank. Oh, uh, you know, absolutely. I would have had a hard time surviving going through this without Barney Frank, because Barney Frank is scary smart. Yeah. Okay? So he understood the issues and he was a patriot. Yeah, so he was going to do things that were very distasteful and he could persuade others. So, David, I now want to go to 10 years ago mm -hmm. when you set up the Institute of Politics at the yeah. University of Chicago. 
And the Paulson Institute was your next door neighbor. Yes. It was impressive to see you turn your vision into a reality, which has made, I think, an enduring contribution to the university and has had a big impact on many students' lives. So you talked about Bob Zimmer, and but what was the motivation behind the IOP? And I, I want to also hear about the David Axelrod management principles that mm-hmm. helped you build that institute into what it is today. Because let me tell you, when it started out, I thought I was positive about it, but I didn't see it becoming what it is today. And so it's been very significant. So talk a bit about that, the vision, and then what it took to build it and the management principles. I knew when I was finishing the Obama campaign in 2012, I knew before it started, this would be my last campaign. And I felt that way for for several reasons. One was um, that I, I knew I would never find a partner in a candidate or an office holder who I would have the kind of synergy that I had with Barack Obama and that everybody would seem less in comparison and I'd be frustrated. The second is it's just, you know, it's an incredibly draining, you know, campaigns, presidential campaigns are gauntlets and um, I'd done several of them and I I knew I didn't want to do any more of those. But the thing that I, I didn't want to say goodbye to was the opportunity to be surrounded by idealistic young people who were brimming with the the sense of mission about making the world a better place, you know, and they were, the campaigns were teeming with these young people. The White House was teeming with these young people. And I said, what could I do that would keep me in touch with these young people, allow them to inspire me and perhaps me to help inspire them? And I had been on the board of the Harvard Institute of Politics, which is sort of the granddaddy of all institutes of politics. And uh, from that experience, I thought I'd really like to start one of these in Chicago. And uh, the University of Chicago was the logical place because I knew how much it needed it because I had gone there. My wife's father was on the medical faculty here for 50 years. And, uh, you know, I thought I could be the most value added there, but I needed to know that Zimmer would support it. He did. And Uh, You know, the greatest obstacle for me, Hank, at the beginning was that there was a great deal of skepticism among conservative students and faculty members and board members as to whether I was equipped to run a nonpartisan institute of politics. And I tried to explain, and this conversation that people just heard about Barney Frank and you and, you know, speaks to it. I honor people who are in public service. I honor people who are engaged in the political system because they want to be they believe in this country they want to serve they want to make the country better even if i disagree with them on how we get there you know i always tell the story about your old boss uh, president bush and how incredibly kind he was and supportive he was to all of us in the transition not just supplying the things that we needed but giving us encouragement because despite the fact that we had differences and we certainly weren't kind to him in the campaign, he knew that he felt that he was a trustee of the democracy and it was his job to hand that democracy over in good shape to the next president. And so, you know, I had to, I had to persuade people that this was going to be a nonpartisan institute, that there would be the involvement of people across the political spectrum. We made good on that. That was job number one. In terms of my management principles, you know, I have the same view. I, I, I approached it in the same way that I approached campaigns, that I approached in in building my own businesses. I think that culture, morale are absolutely important, essential qualities. And I, I want people to feel like they're part that like they're knit together in a in a mission, in a cause, and that each each person has an, an essential role to play and that we all are reliant on each other. So building a team is to me a sort of fundamental to success. And then, you know, being discerning about the people who will play those roles to make sure that A, they would embrace such a culture, but B, that they brought the unique set of skills necessary. I was lucky enough to to have an incredible team, uh, build an cr- incredible team from the beginning. And then the third thing was, you know, you have to go out and uh, sell your idea in the marketplace and uh, get people to invest in it. And there were people who early on were willing to uh, support the Institute of Politics. The university certainly gave us a great deal of support, still do, but 
some of the early Penny Pritzker and others who invested and Brian Traubert and, you know, they, Fred Eichner, there, there are people who were early donors to the IOP and it made a huge difference. So you're now stepping down in January, going to stay involved, but uh, you like to work. So where are you going to be devoting your energy and talent? Like <laughs> well, first of all, let me say, I uh, uh, I knew from the beginning that I would serve 10 years right, uh, and no more than 10 years because I felt like, I mean, my, my you ask about my philosophy of management. One of them is that you reach a point where it's comfortable to stay but it's not good for you and it's not good for the organization. Not good for you because change is good. It's not good for the organization because you start doing things, even if you're passionate and even if you're good, you start doing things by rote and you don't become, you're not as entrepreneurial as you were at the beginning. And uh, really? yeah, you know, so I love the place so much that I wanted to make sure that it maintained its entrepreneurial edge, that it maintained the, the energy that I thought was necessary. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm thrilled. Heidi Heidkamp, the former senator from North Dakota, will be the new IOP director. She is she is an extraordinary person. I think she's, she's going to do a great job. So I really feel great about the Success in terms of myself, you know, as you point out, I'm I'm not I'm going to stand on the board. The the uh, university has uh, given me an appointment as uh, a uh, distinguished fellow at the IOP and the Harris School of Public Policy. I'm I call it the an extinguished fellow, but I'm going to I'm going to be doing uh, events at both places, and uh, so that will be one thing I'll do. Uh, I continue with my work. Uh, you know, I'm a senior commentator at CNN. I have a couple of podcasts of my own that have been, you know, around for a while, successful. I'll do that. I'll continue to do that. And I'd like to do some writing, which I haven't had the time to do since I wrote my uh, my last book. But the other thing, Hank, is, you know, and you certainly appreciate this. The older I get, the more I appreciate the finite nature of time. And I've got a great family. I remember I was on John Stewart's show the night he announced he was leaving the the Daily Show, and he said, um, "You know, I'm uh, I'm told I have a wonderful family. I, I really look forward to getting acquainted with them. I, I have a uh, I have a wonderful family, and I want to spend more time with them. I just had my third grandchild, and uh, it's it's a one of the things the pandemic did for me is I I never really appreciated how sublime a walk in the woods with my wife and my dog could be." I don't want to be one of these people who is who's working so hard till the end of their life that you know you you get to the end and you realize all the things that you wanted to do that had nothing to do with work uh, that had everything to do with family and friends uh, that you never did. I, I don't want to be that person. Amen. Now let's talk about the state of our democracy. Many people have a sense that our democratic experiment is in a state of serious decline. Do you share that view, and can you put today's dysfunction in a historical context? Do you think we're seeing a new level of dysfunction, or have we seen this movie before? Well, listen, we we live in a country where we've fought a civil war, so it's really hard not to say that we haven't seen high levels of division and dysfunction and polarity uh, before. The thing that I think makes this a little different is that you have to add the um, the element of technology churning at the rate that it's churning, particularly communications technology, you know, where the incentive is to uh, to keep people online, to keep people engaged, and and the great uh, insight that they that the social media platforms have struck on is that you know outrage is a tremendous tool to keep people online. They have algorithms that drive you into these media silos. And and so we find ourselves more and more siloed where we're our views are affirmed, but they're not necessarily informed. And we treat everybody who lives outside that silo as the enemy. And and politics has sort of followed that path. So, you know, I, I often use the example of uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, who I don't think has much caloric content, but nonetheless, she is one of the leading fundraisers in the Republican Party. Why? Because she says outrageous things and people online respond to it and they send her money. And, you know, with uh, fewer and fewer competitive 
states and districts, the big fear for politicians who want to get elected is is less about general elections than about primary elections. And all the incentives now are to be to cater to the outrage rather than to uh, shine a light on problems and how we solve them together. So I think we've got, yeah, we've got significant challenges. And and Hank, I, I would add one other. And since I'm sitting with you, I, I feel like I, I should make it because I know you're thoughtful about these issues. We have an economy that has worked very, very well for some people and, you know, not as well for others. And that has had an impact on our politics. So a lot of the outrage is directed at all institutions, government, financial institutions, all. In, I just had, we had a conversation today at the Institute of Politics about this. You know, the two public institutions that people still feel positively about are uh, the military and firefighters. Everything else is, you know, all private institutions, public institutions. People feel institutions have failed us. Uh, apropos to the conversation we had before, there are a lot of people in this country who think government is corrupt who think government is rigged against them. They think that people above them get bailouts, people below them get handouts, and they're left to struggle for themselves. We can argue on the substance of some of this, but I think that the fate of democracy and the fate of capitalism are linked. Absolutely. And, you know, if you believe in, in markets and capitalism and you study history, you realize that they need to keep changing. They have to adapt. I think it's the best system there is but it, it needs to adapt to meet the challenges of the time. And what is making it more complicated, I think, is technology, because I think technology has got huge promise, but it also seems to be moving faster than government's ability to, to understand it and manage 100%. it. 100%. And so that's a huge issue. There's this interesting tension within the Democratic Party today. It's between those who want to focus on kitchen table or working class issues and those who want to emphasize issues of identity, like gender and race. And how do you think Democrats should navigate th these issues? When we ran in 2008, people forget that Barack Obama, yes, he was the first Black president. We never talked about that. We never talked about the historic nature of it. He, When he was asked, he would say, I, I am proudly of the Black community, but I'm not running to be the Black president. I'm running to be president of the whole United States of America. And we talked about issues that people felt in their lives across this country. Uh, you know, people have fundamental aspirations for themselves and their families. And uh, we, we talked about those things. We didn't emphasize our differences so much as our, you know, as our share, our common humanity. And um, I'm not saying that I, I think part of making ourselves a better country is confronting injustices that that need to be confronted. But um, we also have to have this broader conversation about uh, the issues that we all share. And, you know, I think one of the failings of the Democratic Party in recent times has been not to spend enough time really focused on those issues that are a broad concern and also just not being commonsensical about these things. You know, it is not it is not offensive to me to say, you know, crime and homelessness are problems that we have to deal with. That's not offensive to me. I don't think Democrats should shy away from that. Uh, discussion. We can talk about how that, how we need to do that. But, you know, people uh, want to be safe in their community. They don't want the human beings sleeping on the streets. You know, I, I think we want people to be treated fairly. But, you know, President Obama has spoken recently about you can be so uh, super sensitive to these issues that, you know, you become, you know, in your in your desire to promote tolerance, you become intolerant. So, I mean, I, I just think whatever happens in the midterm elections, both parties have a lot of soul searching to do. The Republican Party has significant problems because it's in the grip of a kind of fever that I think is, is really fundamentally scary. But uh, the Democratic Party, in order to um, build a larger constituency, can't write off 80 percent of the country. You know, Donald Trump won 80 percent of the counties in this country in losing in 2020. And yes, President Trump, if you're listening, you did lose in 2020. But Democrats can't write off those areas. And Hank, the danger is that the Democratic Party becomes 
a kind of college educated tisk tisk look down our noses at uh, people who work with their hands, work with their backs, people who we call essential workers when we have a crisis and then kind of write off when we don't. That that would be a terrible thing for the Democratic Party to do. Also, I think there's a backlash in much of the country against identity politics, uh, cancel culture, uh, politics of grievance just going so far. It's, it's finding the balance there. Yeah, I mean, just just let me say that I agree with all of that. But, you know, the same politicians who talk about cancel culture are now now want to decide what books people yeah. should read. Oh, and, it, it's, just, uh, you know. it's a crazy, crazy world. But let's talk about something that's more fun. You and I are both Chicago Bulls fans, right? And they, yeah, we are. They, they beat the Celtics. They beat the I was there. NBA. Tell our listeners what other things you do to relax in your free time. Well, I am a, a huge sports fan. My father was an immigrant from Eastern Europe, and I think he learned how to play baseball before he learned how to speak English. And he became an all-city baseball player in New York. And we used to be at the ballpark every weekend. So I love baseball. I'm excited as we record this conversation. It's the first day of the World Series. I'm going to settle in tonight and watch that and toggle back and forth between that and the Bulls and uh, and, and San Antonio. Me, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, sports is a big thing. And, you know, as you know, Hank, I mean, this is something that you pass from generation to generation. When these games are going on, I'm texting with my two grown sons, you know, who are watching the same games. And it's amazing because it's your childhood team. Like there was a time when Goldman Sachs was an investor in Yankee Nets and so I would be in Steinbrenner's box for the World Series games. But if the Cubs had got there, I've got to tell you, and they came very, very close one year. Yes. You know, Dusty Baker didn't bring in Borowski, right? And, yes. And uh, we lost a critical game. But if the Cubs had been there, I would have been for the Cubs. Yeah, good for you. Well, I come from New York, and I, re I was a Mets fan. I hated the Yankees. I was a Mets fan. And when uh, until they traded Tom Seaver away in 1977, and then I then oh I completely transferred my loyalties to Chicago. And the good thing about that is because I'm not from here originally, I don't have tribal loyalty. So I have seasons tickets for the Cubs and the White Sox. I unabashedly root for both of them. I love being a Chicago sportsman. But the other thing is, I mentioned to you before, increasingly, I am so pleased just to spend time with my family, time with my friends, walking with my dog in the woods. You know, those are sublime things. So that's a big part of my life now, too. So, David, this has been great. But let's close with your advice to younger listeners. So what advice do you give students who are navigating their lives and their careers in today's rapidly changing world? So what, what do you tell students? Yeah, well, I think the in that in the context of your question, the thing I would say most is do not make 30 year plans because uh, they will not serve you well. And do not feel if you're not living up to your 30 year plan that you're failing. Uh, the nature of, of the world today is that opportunities are going to come uh, at a much faster pace and there'll be things available to you that you haven't even imagined. Uh, so follow your passions, uh, follow your interests uh, and, and, and see where they lead. Uh, and beyond that, you know, all I ask of you is Justice uh, Brandeis said the highest office in a democracy is the office of citizen. And I just ask that people understand we now know democracy is not a, a gift. It's a responsibility. It's a project. And each of us has a responsibility to participate in it. So uh, pay attention and be involved and engaged and demand the kind of politics and government that you think this country needs and deserves. So, David, thank you. You've given our listeners a lot to think about and a model of a career dedicated to public service and advocacy. So thanks, thanks a lot. Hank. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.